This is GM Word of the Week Live, and I'm Fiddleback. <laughs> Dragons. Imagine, if you will, a brave party of adventurers. There'll be the fighty one, the sneaky one, the healy one, and the magic -y one. They've had long storied careers of adventuring. They fought the bog monsters of marshy salt. They saved the village of Hamlet from the invading forces of evil. They even took care of the really nasty thing with big sharp teeth in the spooky castle that was constantly shrouded in mist by order of the king. Heck, odds are at least one of them even survived the sepulcher of nearly certain and definitely unexpected death, because that's what adventurers do. But no adventurer can really call his or her career complete without one final challenge to tick off the list of things every adventurer must do. They have to go out and rescue the princess from the dragon. Or the prince. Or if their GM is particularly interested in trope busting, they could rescue the dragon from the princess. <laughs> or the prince. Now obviously if we're going to talk about dragons, we have to start by talking about what a dragon actually is. Now, I don't want to shock any of you, but dragons are mythical creatures. They don't actually exist. There are some things we can definitely say about them though. For instance, the word dragon comes from the ancient Greek dracon, which means serpent. But it's actually derived from a much older word, dirkeshtai, which means to have keen sight. Generally, dragons are depicted as large reptilian monsters. They usually have wings, claws, and horns. And dragons often have the power to breathe fire, though Dungeons and & Dragons and other fantasy games like to play with that idea. But we'll come back to that later. Unfortunately, that's about all we can say for sure about dragons, generally speaking. See, one of the most fascinating things about dragons is that dragons are one of those things that pop up in lots of different mythologies across the world. It seems like every ancient culture has some giant reptilian monster. Just like lots of ancient creation myths begin with a dark, chaotic void being suddenly ordered, illuminated, and separated. And whenever you see something appear independently in lots of different myths, especially when those people had no contact with each other, you have to wonder just what's up. Now, lots of anthropologists and historians have proposed theories for where dragon myths come from. Often, when a creature shows up in ancient mythology, it's because someone once half glimpsed an unknown, but perfectly normal, animal while wandering home drunk late. They told the tale of their brave, heroic escape, and over time, the tale was exaggerated and embellished until eventually, the stray alley cat became a giant, dagger-clawed, lion-faced, riddle-spewing sphinx that he single-handedly defeated, using only his wits and half a pint mug. He hardly even pees himself in his version of the story. That's more or less how the Egyptian cobra became the basilisk, and the African wildebeest became the catoblopus. And there are certainly animals that would inspire tales of giant killer reptiles. Australian aboriginal dragon myths might have been inspired by the goanna, a large species of predatory monitor lizard. And the Nile crocodile of northern Africa could certainly have passed for a dragon, what with being 18 feet long and kind of unique among the crocodilian species for being able to walk with its body elevated off the ground instead of merely dragging along on its belly. Even extinct animals might have inspired dragon myths. Back in the 4th century BCE, the Chinese historian Chang Ku discovered a pile of giant bones and labeled them dragon bones. The 30-foot beast had a spiked tail and armored plates along its back for defense. But then Chang Ku didn't know anything about the Stegosaurus, or its primitive ancestor, the Hoangosaurus that had gone extinct 165 million years prior. So he can kind of be forgiven for calling it a dragon. But those sorts of explanations suggest that the prevalence of dragons in mythology is basically accidental. 
All of these different cultures just happen to mistake something for a giant winged death lizard. But in his book, An Instinct for Dragons, anthropologist David E. Jones surveyed dragon myths from across the globe, examined the common threads in each, and concluded that evolution might be to blame. Humans have an instinctive fear of predators, like every animal, and the dragon might merely represent a hybrid of all the worst aspects of predators smashed into one super terror by the human imagination. He also examines various cultural artifacts to explain how those myths evolved over time. His book, released in 2000, received a lot of criticism, but it's still a fascinating study on dragon folklore, even if the idea of some sort of universal fear of the all predator isn't the reason for the dragon's ubiquity in myth. You know, yeah, I'm sorry. That just made me think of something that we, I, you know, we sh- should have added it in. I'm sorry about that. But it reminds me of a really, really cool German phrase, okay? Have you ever heard uh, collectivus unbewusstus? Okay, there's a really cool phrase, and it came from this guy um, who was really one of the first people to call bull on Sigmund Freud's obsession with sex to his face. Now, uh, like, we all know Sigmund Freud, right? Um, he's, he's sort of referred to as the, the father of modern psychology. He was actually a doctor, but he saw himself more as a scientist. And, you know, he was, he was fascinated by the study of psychological disorders. And what happened was, uh, so there was this other uh, psychologist, Joseph Brewer, and he had started doing some work, and he had discovered that if you let a hysterical patient start talking about their problems, and they would talk and talk and talk, and he just kind of sat back and just guided them into the past to keep talking about the things, eventually they would almost talk themselves out of some of their symptoms. And what happened was Brewer and Freud started working on this idea that maybe the origin for psychological disorders was something that happened to someone in the past. And that if you could get back to that, then you could help them work through their problems. Now, Freud kind of went off on his own after that. He worked with Brewer for a while. But afterwards, he started getting involved in some stuff that was considered like pseudoscience at the time, you know, psychic energy and dream interpretation and all this other bullshit. And Brewer didn't want to have anything to do with them. So Freud went off on his own, but his ideas still started to form the basis for what was um, eventually became sort of what we call the school of psychoanalysis. The idea that you can solve someone's psychological problems by figuring out the root cause and then addressing that cause. Um, He's also famous, just as a tangent, sorry, I I don't mean to hold you up, but just as a tangent, you know, he also came up with the idea of the three-part psyche. Okay, the idea that you could break down a person's psyche into three things. First, you have the id, which actually comes from the Latin word meaning it, because that refers to your animal self, those impulses, those appetites, the lusts, all the terrible stuff that you want to do. Then you have the ego, and that comes from the Latin word for I or me. It was another pronoun. And that's the personality and consciousness. That's who you are. The person maybe you think you should be, kind of. And then between the two of them, you have this other force of personality, the superego, which means above the ego, above the self. And it sort of regulated your, your morality. It would resolve the conflicts between the it and the self. And that, that was like his theory. And he became really renowned for this stuff. And he was sort of revolutionizing psychology. Then a few years later, along comes someone else. Carl Gustav Jung. He also, he was a prodigy, really. He had a lot of different interests. He was brilliant. He studied biology. He studied physics. He loved science. But his mother was struggling with a lot of mental illness, and that pushed him in the direction of psychological study. And obviously, when he started studying psychology, he studied the theories of the day. And at that point, you know, the new hotness was Freud. Everybody was studying Freud. And so he started studying Freud. And he started to get a name for himself, too. Eventually, the two of them meet. They have a great meeting. They hit it off. They have so much to talk about. They talk for like 15 hours straight. And they think that they have developed this great friendship and this great partnership that, within a few months, falls apart. They manage to work together for like five years, gradually growing to hate one another. And that's because, in Jung's mind, Freud had gone really off the deep end. 
Freud started to look at the psychological development of morality of the superego as entirely related to sexual trauma and the sexual relationship that kids have with their parents. His idea was that every kid had inside of them this desire to have sex with their opposite sex parent and to eliminate and supplant the presence of the same sex parent in the relationship. And that started to kind of, you know, along with other things, because Freud did have a lot, like there was the whole development of, you, you know, like the anal stage of development, the oral stage of development, and interrupting all of these things during childhood development would lead to all sorts of different neuroses later. So he was kind of all over the place. And Jung was like, I don't want anything more to do with this. This is getting a little wacky. So Jung started to distance himself from Freud. The problem was, Freud was hot. You know, everybody was still on to Freud for a while before Freud, everybody started like, I don't know, Freud. So Jung started to get ostracized by the community. But that's not really important. The thing that made me think of him was that whole thing that you said about how we might have these, you know, these ideas of what a predator is and they feed into our mids because that goes back to this idea of the collective unconscious. So Jung felt that the development of personality was a little bit more complicated. Sure, you had your experiences and your memories and you know, everything that was you, but also your brain had been growing up as, this, as a result of you know, everybody that came before you. There was genetics, there was biology, and that left these ideas in your brain, these latent fears of the dark, of death, whatever. And because of just the way the human brain is wired, we would all see the same symbols, regardless of where we came from. And those became called primordial images or archetypes. And that's what kind of fed into that idea of the collective unconscious. That also feeds into ideas like tarot reading and all this other stuff that's all based on these symbols that supposedly we all share. But, oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, D dragons. I'll I'll <laughs> yeah, but I digress, right. Right. Uh, oh, dragons, common threads, yeah, okay. Uh, one of the most pronounced cultural differences between, between dragons and human mythology is the difference between the so-called Western and Eastern dragons, or rather, European dragons and Chinese dragons. And these differences start with their appearance. European dragons are large winged reptiles. They're huge and spiky and clawed and heavily armored. Those are the sorts of dragons that eat dwarves and burglars and lake towns and arkenstones. But Chinese dragons are very different. They're long and sinuous and serpentine. They aren't depicted with wings, but they can fly. And unlike European dragons who live in caves and forests, Chinese dragons live in the sky or underwater. But most interesting of all, the earliest depictions of Chinese dragons prominently show them to be a hodgepodge of animal features. Chinese dragons have the neck and body of a snake, but their scales are large and triangular and coppery because they have the scales of a carp. They have the they have the antlers of a deer, the talons of an eagle, and the paws of a lion. But the differences don't stop at their appearance. The Chinese dragon, or Lung, as it is called, was a noble creature. It was associated with prosperity, abundance, and good fortune. They were divine messengers, and they would bring rain to feed crops. And instead of fire, they exhaled the essence of life, Shang Ki. Though some dragons could be sent to avenge wrongs or bring down divine justice and, and did breathe fire. Essentially, dragons were the symbols of the life and fertility of the lands of China and her people. In fact, the Chinese people have called themselves Lung Tik Shan Ren, the descendants of the dragon. The first true emperor of Chinese civilization, Fu Shi, was said to be descended from a dragon and even had a dragon's tail. And the four greatest rivers in China were named after dragons. But dragons in Chinese mythology are actually more varied and complicated than you might think. In Chinese folklore, for example, there are nine different major types of dragons. There's the horn dragon, who brings rain, but can't hear. There's the wing dragon. There's the Tianlong, or celestial dragon, that keeps the gods from falling out of the sky. 
There's the spirit dragon, which brings weather to benefit humankind. The Foot Sang is the dragon who guards hidden treasures. The Coiled Dragon lives in rivers. The Yellow Dragon emerged from the sea and taught the Emperor Fuxi language. And the Dragon King is actually four separate dragons who rule the four different seas. And alongside these nine types of dragons, there are also nine traditional representations of dragons. First are the dragons carved on bells and gongs, representing their powerful roar. Second are the dragons carved on musical instruments, because dragons like music. Third are the dragons that adorn scrolls and tablets, because dragons like to read. Fourth are the dragons carved at the bottom of monuments, representing their great strength. Fifth are the dragons adorning the doorways of temples, because dragons are watchful and vigilant predators. Sixth are the dragons decorating bridges, because dragons like to swim. Seventh are the dragons that are often carved on Buddha's throne because dragons like to sit and rest just as much as Buddha. Eighth are the dragons inscribed on swords, representing their fearsomeness. And ninth are the dragons carved on the gates of prisons and jails because some dragons just like to make trouble and start fights. Look, 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 okay. Sorry. I'm really trying not to do this here. But Pokemon. The Pokemon. Okay, no, Pokemon. no, no. <laughs> No, no, it's good, it's good, it's good. Listen, that carp thing, right? Dragons have the scales of a carp, you said that. I know, because I wrote, wrote it. it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but, no, no, there sh we should, can, uh, we really need to fix this. Because, so this is the thing, like if you play Pokemon, I, I, like I don't, I don't, but if I did, I would, I would know that it's basically this game where a bunch of kids wander around the world collecting supernatural creatures and forcing them into dog fights for everybody's amusement. You know, for kids, right? Um, and one of the things in Pokemon is this idea of evolution, right? The, when a Pokemon gets so powerful, he evolves into a new Pokemon. And, okay, right, okay, we all know that's not evolution, right? People don't evolve, or individual things don't evolve. Evolution is something that happens to a whole population, which is also something Star Trek needs to remember, right? Okay, so what happens in a population is someone is born, they have a slightly advantageous trait, a slightly longer neck or some shit like that, excuse my language. They pass that on to their kids because they're able to eat a little better than the other ones. And then the kids have slightly longer necks, so on and so on and so on. And over millions of years and trial and error and all that shit, eventually the creature has a longer neck. Eventually, over many, many accidental mutations and births and stuff, it's not a creature suddenly turns into a more powerful creature, okay? But in Pokemon, it's a little bit simpler. It's just a creature turns into a more powerful creature. You got a rock golem, and he might turn into a rock golem with four arms, you know, because that's how evolution works, right? Or, um, oh, oh, what's the thing? There's like a psychic goblin, and he evolves into a psychic goblin with spoons. Abra, Abra, Abra. That's the one, Abra, Kadabra, and Alakazam. Um, and then, um, not the, that you know. The, not that I know. <laughs> yeah, right. And then you got a turtle, and he evolves into a turtle with, uh, you know, mechanical water cannons coming out of his shell. Because, again, evolution, it's all scientific. But I, anyway, I didn't mean to get off the subject because. The carp, thank you, magic carp. <laughs> who is a carp who is magic? That's how they do the naming thing, okay? And he, well, he turns into what? He turns into... Gyarados. Gy Gyarados, a, a, a serpentine a eastern dragon. Point conceded. With carp scales, and why? Well, it turns out that there is actually this, this phrase that ties this all together. And it goes, Liu Tiao Lung Men. Okay, now forgive me, my Chinese pronunciation, not great. But the phrase means the carp has jumped through the gate. Okay? Um, and what, or actually it means the carp has jumped through the dragon gate. And that goes to this legend that at the headwaters of the Yellow River, there is this massive waterfall called the Dragon's Gate. And, well, okay, so carp are freshwater fish, right? And lots of freshwater fish have this life cycle where they will spend most of their lives in rough waters because, you know, they can swim with and against the current. It helps them gather food and what have you. But to spawn, they need shallow, calmer waters. So they tend to swim upstream. 
And this is actually a bit of an evolutionary process too, because the best swimmer, swimmers are the ones that can make it back to the spawning ground. So uh, over time, they become stronger swimmers, right? So this is just the habit of freshwater fish. And eventually they'll get to their spawning ground, the waters are shallow, they're calmer, uh, the, men and the males and the females will pair off, a carp will spawn. Like a female carp will, will gather sperm from four to seven different male carps. Then they'll lay their eggs in the shallows. The shallow waters are safe, they're, they're calm, so the, the, the little fish hatch. They can eat until they grow large enough, go back downstream, form schools, and then the whole thing just keeps going on and on and on. But the legend says that if there's a carp that's a powerful enough swimmer, that he can actually get up this waterfall, the Dragon's Gate, he will be magically transformed into dragon. And that is where you get this idea that dragons have carp scales, but it's also where you get this phrase, the, the, the carp has jumped over the Dragon's Gate or jumped through the Dragon's Gate. Now, nowadays, um, a lot of folks, and I'm not sure because again, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure, but a lot of times this phrase gets used in China for foreign born people who have come to study at Chinese universities and managed to pass the rigorous examinations and graduate. And it's almost a way of saying, because as you pointed out, the Chinese are the people of the dragon. It's almost a way of saying that you have come here, worked really hard, and you're now one of us. But the phrase is older than that. It's not just the modern university system, because back in imperial China, in order to work for the imperial bureaucracy, you had to pass competitive examinations, and it was hard. You worked your ass off. And when you finally graduated and had earned that place in you know, working for the emperor, whose symbol was the dragon, you had swum against the current and proven yourself and become part of the dragon. So the carp jumps through the gate like the Pokemon, like, <laughs> yeah, okay, sorry, sorry, just, just go, just go, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. You're done now. Yeah, I'm done, okay? <laughs> okay, I'm done, I'm done, go, just go. Right. I'm done. <clears throat> Even though we split dragons into this sort of binary east and west division, you can see things as more complicated than that. The rich folklore of dragons in China isn't the only dragon folklore in the East. For example, you might compare the usually deceitful Indian serpents called Naga of the Mahabharata with dragons. And in Europe, there are actually many different folkloric traditions about dragons. Greek mythology is rife with dragons, and among the most famous of the Greek dragons was the Colchian dragon. It guarded the Golden Fleece that Jason sailed in search of along with his Argonauts. And the thing never slept, and Jason was only able to sneak past it with the help of the sorceress Medea, who bewitched the beast. In fact, Greek mythology is loaded with dragons, and serpents, and they all guard things. Heracles, or Hercules to you, had to kill the Hesperian dragon to claim the golden apples of Hesperides. Zeus had a sacred grove at Nemea that was guarded by the Nemean dragon, Ares' sacred spring in Thebes. How hard is it to say? Was guarded by the Asimonean dragon, and so on. And these guardian serpents are the reason why the name dragon derives from the Greek word for vigilance, as I mentioned before. Of course, the Greeks also had a lot of other dragon-like creatures. They loved their mythological monsters, Scylla, Scythia, the Hydra, and the Chimera. They had so many serpents and dragons and monsters with dragon-like qualities that I don't have time to go into them all. No, I really don't. <laughs> Sorry. Not if you keep interrupting. Sorry. And it was these Greek monsters that inspired Roman mythology, and that eventually spread across Europe and evolved into the common form of European dragon that we associate with Dungeons and Dragons today. In Roman mythology, the Greek serpents were merged with dragons of Near Eastern mythology, and that's really when dragons started to look like dragons in Europe. Four legs, claws, crests, horns, wings, powerful, cunning, and dangerous. Pliny the Elder, the famous Roman naturalist, wrote a great deal about dragons in his Encyclopedia of Natural History. 
even took the time to debunk the myth that the Greek stories about dragons were inspired by Nile crocodiles or Indian cobras. No, dragons were real, according to Pliny, and had nothing to do with other reptiles. That was just silly. Pliny even told a story about how a dragon and an elephant had crushed each other to death during a fight. According to Roman legend, dragons were just big, powerful creatures, smart and strong, but just animals, really. And they were seen as symbols of strength and military might by the Romans who adopted it, first as the symbol of their national sport, and then as their military standard. But when Christianity started to spread, the dragon evolved into a symbol of evil, a destructive monster to be slain. And that brings us around to the story of England's patron saint, St. George. According to the tales, St. George was a Palestinian-born Christian who became a Roman soldier in the 3rd century CE. When the Roman Emperor Diocletian implemented his policies persecuting Christians, George objected. When he received written orders to arrest Roman Christians, he tore up those orders. He was promptly imprisoned and tortured, but he would not denounce his faith. Ultimately, he was publicly beheaded. His wife, who had not been Christian, was so moved by his faith that she converted to Christianity at his execution. And she was promptly arrested and beheaded. It was a tough time to be a Christian. Now that is more or less what we believe to be true about St. George. But it's hard to say for sure because the story of St. George only really spread in 1483 as part of a book called The Golden Legend. That book detailed the mythical exploits of many Christian saints, including St. George, and how he killed the dragon. See, this dragon had taken up residence in Libya and was exacting a tribute from the city of Selene. The residents provided the dragon with two sheep every day to keep it from destroying the city. And then, one day, inevitably, they ran out of sheep, which is a problem. So the king decided he had to start offering people a well-known sheep substitute. The people were chosen by lottery and sent off to become dragon chow. And this worked out okay for a while. But then, the king's daughter won the lottery, or lost, and she was to be sacrificed. Perhaps it was an unreasonable policy after all. Maybe it really wasn't the best way to deal with a dragon. Fortunately, just then, St. George showed up. George fought the dragon, but he didn't kill it. Rather, he overpowered it, leashed it, and gave it to the princess to lead into the city. The dragon <laughs> meekly followed, because that's what dragons do when they are chained to their former prospective lunch. When the king and the city folk saw the tamed dragon, they converted to Christianity. Because how can you argue with someone who puts a dragon on a chain? And then they built the Church of Our Lady and St. George, from which a healing fountain sprung. Okay. No, no, because I just thought of something. That thing with leashing the dragon, right? Okay, do you ever read the, the first edition AD&D Monster Manual? Okay, this is the one Gygax wrote uh, back in 77. Right? Yeah. The, the thing is, as I was basically, if, if you don't play Dungeon Dragons, then, well, first of all, I don't know why you're here. But if you don't, <laughs> if you don't play Dungeon Dragons, the Monster Manual is basically a list of all the monsters you might encounter in the game and all, all the rules for dealing with them and whatever. But the dragon entry was really, really, really extensive. You know, because they're dragons. They're, you know, they're right in the name of the game. Dungeons and dragons, you know. Other than giving top billing to the ampersand, what are you going to do? So... But the thing is, there were some really weird rules in there that no other monster had. And one of them was this thing about subduing a dragon. You could actually choose, while you're beating a dragon to death, suddenly to say to your GM, I didn't mean it. And instead of dealing a killing blow, you subdued the dragon. And now the dragon was tamed. 
And you could tame the dragon, and as long as it was treated well and given plenty of food and treasure and not abused, but still treated with a firm hand, now you had this dragon pet. But more importantly, like the, the thing goes on. It's, after you have this tame dragon, there's markets and towns where you can sell these dragons. You know, there, there's like this active, like previously owned dragon economy in AD&D First Edition, right? And it's certified licensed. You get the whole thing, right? So it's just. But I think that whole subdual thing might be a reference to King George. So when we, you know, when we do this, we write that, write that in. When, when we do it. Yeah, okay. when we do it. Okay. Just hold on a second, because there was another crazy rule too. There was this thing like okay. two crazy rules in AD and D. Well, there were okay. <laughs> You want me to take your script away? <laughs> no, no, but seriously, there was this crazy rule, too, about sleeping dragons. Dra oh, unique in the game, in that when you came upon a dragon, your GM had to actually roll a chance to see if it was asleep. And if it was asleep, you could kill it in its sleep, because e dragons are notoriously easy to kill in fantasy adventures, right? T easy to tame, easy to kill. They had special rules that made them easier to tame and kill because they were the most powerful things ever. But that sleep thing, maybe, maybe like, that's... A reference to the Medea, she she bewitched the dragon so the Jason could sneak past it, right? I mean, we know, we know that Gygax referenced some of this stuff before he went on his own crazy tangent with dragons because he told us, right? He did that, he did the interview, mm -hmm. he did this web interview, and then he wrote the preface for um, Mongoose Publishing, they did the, the Slayer's Guide to Dragons, like 2002 or whatever. And he wrote about the whole creation of the dragon things. Because way back in the first one, uh, 74, the, the white box, the first box of D&D, there were, what, six dragons? Right? right? Right, okay. So you had the gold one, right? And the gold one was sinuous and serpentine, not winged, good aligned wise, all that great stuff. And then you had these five other ones, and they were like the monstrous four-legged, four you know, bestial things. And you had the red one and the black one and the green one, and the white one and the blue one, right? And they all had these different breath weapons. You know, that, I mean, that was the crazy thing. Like, so you have this one gold dragon that's different from all the others, and then you have these five dragons that come in different colors and breathe different things. The fire one, or the red one breathes fire, the green one uh, originally spewed chlorine gas, because that's poison. Uh, the black one could vomit acid all over you, and the blue one could spit lightning, and the white one would breathe these frigid blasts of ice cold, right? Where did that come from? Because... In myths, like, I mean, for the fire-breathing dragon with Humbaba in, in Sumerian myth, in the, uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, that's really your first fire-breather dragon. And then after that, that kind of caught on, because that's awesome, right? When you're selling a story, the thing is all a giant monster and can breathe fire. And can breathe fire and proves everything, right? But after that, the only other real mention we see is that the Greeks had the poison dragons. Like, a lot of serpents were poisonous, which, you know, cobras and shit. Which Pliny the Elder, like you said, didn't do, says that's not how it happened. But anyway, but what about the rest? Well, Guy Dax actually explains it all. He said right off the bat that the whole colored thing... Well, first of all, he did admit the gold dragon was his nod to eastern dragons, and the rest of the dragons were the, 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 the western dragons, right? Uh, and, you know, so obviously... But as far as the colored dragons and the weird breath weapons, that actually came from him playing Mahjong. Which is, yeah, Chinese tile placement game. You know, basically you have all these tiles with all these different characters and symbols on them. And there are dragons uh, on some of the tiles. And there are several colors of dragons, specifically red, white, and green. And he found himself, he was looking at this as a kid, and he's like, you know, well, the red dragons, obviously, those are fire dragons. And the, way, the green dragons are the poisonous ones. What does that leave for the white ones? What do the white ones do? Well, obviously, when you're later on, when you're making up a fantasy game, well, you got fire, you got to have ice. And he's like, well, what other cool dragons could I do? I bet I could have a black one, and that could spew acid. And this is where we get this idea of chromatic dragons with weird breath weapons. That's not from mythology. Fire breathers? Yes, fine. Poisonous bites? Yes, fine. All the rest? A, uh, you know, a proctologist with rubber gloves and a, and a flashlight show you where they came from. 
Not, not to disparage Gygax at all, but because it's cool, right? We're all happy with it. But then it goes and spins out of control, like it always does, because now we're adding all these other... First, there were all the other metallic dragons. You, need, you needed to add Bahamut, the, the space fish, which I think we talked about on the show, right? We did. Right, the space fish Bahamut, and Tiamat. Which we also which, talked about. Right, the, the chaos beast that wasn't a dragon at all. And then you got to add all the metallic dragons, then you had the chromatic dragons, and someone doesn't well, you have good dragons and evil dragons, you have to have completely neutral dragons, so what if they were made out of gems? And then you have that. And, well, there's a place for psionics, isn't there? Because there's always got to be a place for psionics. And then other dragons, everyone's got dragons. Spelljammer had your space dragons, your sun dragons, your moon dragons. And that was all these dragons that all grew out of this idea of, well, what does the white one do? That's where it all came from. What does the white one do? Right? And that's all, like, but that just another crazy thing that, you know, mythology, because King George... Or St. George, sorry. St. George, leash the dragon, subdual damage. Fine, you know, fine, just... Fine. I'm sorry, man. Look, I just thought it was cool. Okay. Like, we're here to talk about the history of the game. Yeah. Right? That's what we do. Well, we could go on for hours about dragons. Even in Europe, there are many different folkloric traditions that involve dragons. We talked about the Roman, Christian, and Germanic view... But we didn't even touch on the great serpents of Norse mythology. Or Celtic dragons. Or Welsh dragons. Oh, the Slavic dragons, the one with lots of heads. We didn't discuss Quetzalcoatl. You know, the feathered god of Meso Mesoamerican yeah, yeah. Yeah, mythology. We, you know, and we really didn't even go into the Naga. You just, like, mentioned it. It was like, oh, there was the Naga from the Mahabharata. Anyway, done. Grendel's mother from Beowulf? Yeah, no kidding. Uh, um, I, you know, there's just so many stories to tell about dragons. It's kind of appropriate that they are the monsters that get top billing in Dungeons and Dragons, then. Yeah, because, I mean, there's so many stories about dragons, there's so many stories in Dungeons and Dragons, but... Oh, that reminds me of something else. But, no, 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 we're getting kind of tight on time. No, it, look, this one I'll make quick, okay? It goes right back to the beginning, okay? All right, remember how you said Chinese historian, he had those those Stegosaurus bones, or Hyangosaurus bones, actually, yeah, that he yeah. mistook for a dragon. Right. All right, funny story. When Gygax was running his first games and he was doing dragons for the first time, do you know what he made his first miniature dragon figure for his game out of? I do not. Toy plastic Segasaurus. Kid you not. <laughs> no, no, it's true. Look it up. How awesome is that? This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gmwordoftheweek. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. <laughs>